We bought our first blue box over 10 years ago and we've been using AutoLogic ever since. I'm Edward Huang. We're here at MSpec Performance Lindenhurst. Uh, we do have two other locations, MSpec Middle Village and Essential Auto Care. We are BMW specialists. We do work on uh, all European makes and models and um, we also work on uh, domestics and Asian imports. I used to think that uh, I didn't need help, you know, but as you grow in the industry, you, you just realize that, you know, you can't do it by yourself. It's impossible. As a technician, you know, a lot of times we're working on more than one vehicle at, at, at the same time. So if I have a, uh, an issue with the vehicle, I can put a claim in and then move on to my next car and, and work on that while I'm waiting for a call back. We have a pretty large staff, so I'd say that we are able to request support multiple times a day. Support to me is uh, all-encompassing. Uh, Autologic does help with training, uh, which is huge in our industry, um, on top of being able to diagnose, code, and, and having dealer-level abilities in, in a non-dealer tool. A repair shop definitely needs technical support. Uh, we, we in our industry like to think that we know everything, but with the pace at which our industry is evolving, you can't know everything, it's impossible. And having that technical support there really allows you to confidently go into any job. Good evening, everybody. My name is Tom Morgan, and uh, we've got a little webinar tonight about uh, Mini Cooper, coming to you live from Autologic. Uh, tonight we're going to discuss some common Mini Cooper performance issues, stuff basically that, that I talk about every day on the tech line as I'm trying to help customers uh, with their fault codes. Okay, uh, Moving right along, uh, unmetered air codes. Okay, Basically what we're talking about is um, you might see something like 2B5C, 2B5-6, unmetered fault codes. What this actually means, it's kind of an ambiguous um, explanation by BMW Mini Cooper for uh, leaking air. All right, many times we see um, unmetered air codes and immediately we go for the smoke machine and we put that on there and we smoke it all day and we pressurize the heck out of it and never see the smoke come out. Well, that's a good idea because it'll tell you about external uh, vacuum leaks that you may have on the engine. Certainly possible, certainly could trigger an unmetered air fault code. But what uh, typically is happening is you have something more along the lines of an internal leak. Uh, that is to say, air is leaking inside the components inside the engine. All right. Um, many times, what we what we'll find out, uh, we'll start with something like let's say a valve cover. Okay. Uh, we'll find that uh, on the Mini Cooper, let's say N14 and N18, the two common engines of the day, uh, both turbo engines. All right. We find that uh, many times the valve cover. Uh, is leaking internally. You can't see this with smoke. Okay, this is air that's going into the crankcase. The DME is picking up on this and flagging this uh, rather generous or uh, broad uh, 2B5C uh, fault code, or 2B56, 2B54, 2B58. It goes on and on. Um, so one of the places we may want to start with is a uh, crankcase pressure test. Uh, this would require a little device called a manometer. In the old days, we called that a slack tube, which is a water tube. You don't see too many of them anymore. But the manometer of today uh, is used on the um, valve cover. Uh, the reading is taken through the oil cap, not the dipstick. Okay, a lot of guys put on a dipstick and get an erroneous reading. And we look up the spec, let's say 36 to, you know, or 38 millibar, as is the case in, uh, for the N18. And we want to see what kind of crankcase pressure or vacuum we're creating, and the manometer will tell you that. So the idea is, if we're not breathing, okay, if the engine's not breathing, you'll see this number go way up, okay, and you'll say, all right, well, I have to replace the valve cover. If it goes way down, we know that the engine is breathing, it's just bypassing air, it's pulling air from somewhere. So these can all flag unmetered air codes, because that's what they are. They're unmetered air flowing through the engine that DME can't control. And what we're doing on a direct injected engine is controlling the air. It's all about the air, okay? Uh, quickly, if you will, with direct injected engines, we're directly injecting fuel into the car, okay? The fuel is there. And now it's a question of how well we mix the air to that injected fuel, that high-pressure fuel-injected fuel. 
So we always want to we always want to know where the air is going on this. So many times we can we can look to see if maybe a valve cover would would fix it. Uh, valve covers are not cheap. Uh, the original equipment and valve covers somewhere in the area four hundred dollars. Uh, there are knockoff valve covers that are half that price, and as of late, I've been told that we can now get repair parts for these valve covers, so you may want to look into that. I believe Whirlpack has got what we need. So the disc or the diaphragm can be replaced, and sometimes that's a very affordable, affordable repair instead of replacing the, uh, the whole valve cover assembly for an unmetered air code. <laughs> so what are some of the other things that may happen? Well, let's go back to the N14 engine. Okay, Again, these are turbo engines. Um, Originally designed very poorly, if you ask me. That's my opinion. Okay, uh, what happens here is you have a very small engine and you have a very large turbo. Okay, so right from day one, we're pulling the oil out of the car on a regular basis. Unfortunately, we our customers have been trained to, you know, when they buy their car new, to not open the hood. Everything's covered bumper to bumper. Just stop back every fifteen thousand miles, and we'll give you a free oil change. Well, there's two unfortunate problems with that. By three, four thousand miles, there's no engine oil left. It's all been sucked out by the turbo. So when we wait the other uh, few thousand miles, by the time we get to the dealership, we're pretty much in bad shape. So unmetered air uh, turbos pulling through the valve cover. The valve cover is not doing its job. We're not regulating the air. So along those lines of an engine running with no oil in it, especially one that has um, a Vanos actuator in it, okay. Uh, a Vanos is uh, simply a uh, uh, sort of like a clutch at the end of the camshaft. On the N14, there's one. So it's pretty simple to talk about. We have an intake camshaft with a clutch on it. Okay, It's being turned by a chain, and that chain is hydraulically tensioned. Well, there's that word, hydraulic. Okay, With no oil, we can't make a hydraulic tension, can we? So therefore, the chain flops around. How does that affect our air? Well, our Vanos actuator doesn't know where to be, and now we get cam correlation faults. Again, the DME is trying to uh, calculate a proper stoichiometric mixture for this car, and it can't because it doesn't see the crank position, uh, I'm sorry, cam position in the right uh, place at the right time. So, unmuted air code. All right, we have cams in the wrong position. We have valves open at the wrong time. You'll never see this with smoke. These are valves inside the engine. Okay. So, uh, we want to look at things like that. Um, if you Take one of these fault codes and look it up. You go into ESTO or call up Autologic, whatever it may be. On the face of it, it tells you to change the mass airflow sensor, HFM. And again, another three or four hundred hours that is uh, has never fixed the car. I've, I've, I've done. Uh, I probably feel that call you know a hundred times a week, and 99 times the customer has already put a airflow meter in the car, and we haven't made any progress. So I'm going to recommend we don't jump to that right away. We look at other things on the car. What's going on here? What's stopping my airflow? Okay, so we have to kind of branch out from not only leaks or components that have failed internally, but we have to look at the mechanical parts in the um, valve train, if you will, that affect our air. Um, let me just move up a slide or two here. All right, here we have a picture of the oil cap. I don't know if you guys can see this, but if you can, what you'd be looking at is a little oil cap that goes on our um, Oh, there we go. Sorry about that. My bad. Let me let me catch up a little bit. Okay, here we're looking at a a uh, oil cap that's fitted to a valve cover. It has a little hose nipple on it. This is where our manometer would be attached. Okay, move forward and pass that a little bit. Here's a picture of our valve cover for all you guys that can see this. Basically, this is what it looks like. Okay, if you look at uh, this valve cover. In here, I don't know if you can see the little cursor on here, but just next to the oil cap, there's sort of a hump on this valve cover. This is our turbulence chamber. This is the PCV of the vehicle. So inside there is where all the magic happens for crankcase ventilation, or doesn't happen for crankcase ventilation. So this is what I was talking about, about uh, checking this uh, maybe as a first step for an unmetered air code. I'll bump along a little bit here. Here's our timing chain components. Let's talk about this for a second. Here's a, um, a dual vanos. If you look at figure number seven and eight, we have a dual vanos here. In this case, this would be more along the lines of an N18 engine. And here we have an intake and an exhaust actuator. Okay, and they are tensioned, uh, they are turned by the chain and tensioned by a single uh, chain tensioner. Okay. Basically, what you need to know here is that the intake vanos actuator 
sits at a fully retarded position and advances as it spins. The exhaust actuator acts oppositely, and this creates sort of a power band. So it's this band of actuation or, or cam positioning that the AME is looking at via the cam sensors. This is how it knows where the cams are. So what it says is, this engine is spinning at X amount of RPM, and these valves should be in this position. But as I read O2 stuff going out the back of the car, I see that I've got a wrong mixture. So it starts to look and, and want to determine where these cams are at. And then we can wind up with uh, correlation faults. Okay. But all of these things lend to unmetered air. Okay. Because again, the valves are in the wrong position. They're open too long. They're not open long enough. Maybe they don't open far enough. Okay. Here I gave, uh, gave you guys a picture of the cylinder head. This is an N18 cylinder head. Okay, and if we notice here, we have two camshafts, one intake, one exhaust, but we have this other strange looking thing with a bunch of springs on it. And this is our valve tronic. Okay, let me take a minute to explain valve tronic. In, in the simplest form, what they're trying to do here is control the lift of the intake valves. Okay, again, we're controlling air on a direct injected engine. So the lift of the valves, right, and the duration that they stay open is very significant to the DME calculation. So here, if we wind up with a uh, valvetronic, let's say, actuator motor that's failed, or we haven't relearned the end limits, which can be done with your autologic tool. And I might mention that tonight, as you probably saw in our promotion, okay, we are now offering a free Pico scope with the purchase of our Drive Pro. So having a Drive Pro and a Pico scope, there probably isn't anything you can't um, diagnose on one of these engines. Getting back to the subject, that was my uh, gratuitous pitch for uh, Autologic. But uh, nonetheless, what we're looking at here is the Valvetronic. And what we need to know is that we're not only turning our cams uh, at the right timing, okay, they're, they're where they're supposed to be when the crankshaft is looking for them, but the lift on our valves is correct. The valves are open far enough, okay? Typical situation that we'll get, uh, just to get off track for just a minute, typical situ situation we get into sometimes is car will come in on the on the uh, wrecker, come in on flatbed, and it, the, um, the complaint is I was driving along and then the engine just stopped. Or I parked and I came out and the engine cranks, but it won't start. One of the things you may want to look at is a fault code for the valve tronic. If the valve tronic is not lifting the valves, you'll have all the ingredients for a running engine, but no lift. So therefore, no running engine. So just a little sidebar. So back to subject. Basically, what we're looking at here is, is cam correlation. When I say correlation, I mean that's the position of the cam to the crankshaft as the crankshaft sensor sends the data to the DME. And one of the third factors we want to look at here, or the other factors we want to look at here, is the lift. Or where, what position is the valvetronic in? If those end limits are not learned or the valvetronic's not functioning uh, or there is mechanical damage, maybe one of those springs broke off or one of the uh, followers or lifters or guides, whatever you want to call them, has broken or gotten out of place, you'll have a pretty poor running engine with unmuted air codes. There's a little picture of the camshaft. Basically, what we're looking at here is the cam valve spring, nothing you haven't seen before. Uh, this is a follower. Number eight is a follower. Um, in between that follower and the uh, Valtronic uh, Crescent cam is an intermediate shaft. Uh, those intermediate shafts are uh, measured. Okay, and they have to be changed in match sets. And never, ever, no, not ever can they be removed from the engine and put in any arbitrary position. They have to go back exactly where they came from. So I might be a little off the beaten path to unmetered air codes, but these are all uh, mitigating factors to controlling air. Everything is very precise. This is, this is true German engineering. Everything's measured. Okay, so if we take one of these the heads off, we decide to send it to the machine shop, Let's not take the valve tronic off. Let's send it intact. Let the machinist take it apart. He'll know to, or should know, to keep all the guides and followers and intermediate shafts in their exact spot. Okay, one of the other things I want to show on this camshaft here, and uh, again, it, it, it goes back to our vanos and our valve gear. Um, many times we have a, um, a, a vanos fold code. And uh, these Vanos fault codes are, are very important because uh, when we have correlation faults, Vanos's, uh, Vanos, is that I? Well, Vanos's that are not working, okay, um, we can't have boost. And we're going to be moving towards that, uh, that famous 2885 fault code in just a moment. Uh, one of the 
uh, things that we learn uh, about the Vanos is that it has to have oil pressure. So therefore, one of the first things we're going to do is pull the oil dipstick out, make sure we have enough quantity in the crankcase, enough oil in the crankcase, enough oil pressure to actually go through the solenoid. The solenoid is clear, uh, and that oil pressure can get to the Vanos actuator and actually move the cam. One of the things I want to show here is sometimes when the engine is beaten hard enough, that is, it's been running around with no oil in it long enough, this little seal that's shown here in figure number two can wear away. So we've gone through the process of, let's say, putting solenoids in, Vanos actuators in, timing chain in, new oil filter, engine flush, new oil. Everything's in the car, but we're not making progress. We keep getting a, a correlation fault on the intake side. You may want to pop that cam journal cap off and look to see if this little seal isn't gold or gone altogether. What's happening here is the oil pressure is coming up through the head. Instead of going, uh, being held back by the seal and going into our Vanos actuator, it's actually just returning back to the crankcase. No pressure for the intake on us to work with. Uh, the question asked here is what happens if you mix up the followers? Um, profound misfire that you can't get rid of. You'll throw the, you'll throw the whole shop at it. Uh, the misfire will never go away. So I uh, just wanted to answer that question. All right. Let me bump along a little bit here. I've been talking about the Vanos. I've been talking about the Vanos solenoids. This is what they look like. Okay, on the N18, there's one on the intake side, one on the exhaust side. Their whole job basically is to allow oil pressure to come up uh, through the oil galleys, you know, as pressurized by the oil pump, and control an amount of oil to the Vanos actuator to move the cam position. All right, if you look on these uh, solenoids, they have very fine screens on the end where they protrude into the cylinder head. And these fine screens can pick up all sorts of slag in the engine. So, Again, going back to if we have no oil, they can't function. If we don't change the oil and we've got a lot of garbage in the engine, that slag or that grit that's in the engine, the silt, uh, will pack in on the screen. Uh, sometimes when we get a unmetered air code or when we get a uh, balance correlation code, we may, we may want to start by just taking these solenoids out, give them a good cleaning with brake clean, put them back in, clear the fault code, and drive the car, see if that's all it needs. If that fixes it, we may want to also recommend and engine oil flush, crankcase flush, and some fresh oil and a proper filter. In regards to oil, um, 530 oil in these cars, full synthetic. Um, many of our customers are reporting that there are aftermarket uh, companies out there. Uh, Motul comes up, and I'm not going to start branding, but basically there are a lot of companies out there that are building a better motor oil. Seems to have a little better performance than the factory Mini Cooper that you buy at a premium price. So you may want to mess around a little bit with uh, oil brands and see if that helps you. Let's see what else we got going here. Okay, this is um, an N18 cylinder head shown on our next picture. It shows our, uh, here they're showing us an exhaust vanos solenoid. Um, curious that the exhaust vanos solenoids fail probably uh, twice the rate of the intake uh, vanos solenoid. I think that has to do with the fact that they're positioned right over the exhaust manifold. Uh, again, that's my opinion. I don't know if there's any theory on that. But uh, also here we see the um, VVT actuator or the, or the valve trying to control motor. Uh, this is another actuator that has to be um, calibrated, so to speak. Uh, in other words, when you remove one or install one, uh, you have to relearn the end limits so that the crescent shaft, you know, shown in the picture here, the crescent shaft that increases and decreases our valve lift on the intake side, uh, we'll know how far to go and how far it's gone. In other words, there's a sensor in here that reports back to the DME. Again, the DME being the kingpin here, it has to know where everybody's at, has to know where our where our valves are at, has to know where our cam positioning is, has to know what our oil pressure is. Of course, we have rotational speed as reported by the crank sensor and the cam sensors. Temperature uh, plays into it. We'll get into that in just a little bit. Uh, oil pressure, it all plays into the DME calculations for air control. Um, just a little sidebar before we go too much further. Um, along the way, um, we learned that on direct injected engines, a very profound problem on the N14 and continuing on the N18 is that um, as this oil gets drawn through the engine, either by a bad valve cover or another reason, uh, it has to go somewhere. And uh, before it goes out the tailpipe, it seems to land on the intake valves and it creates uh, a slag, if you will, or a bunch of carbon deposits on the intake valves. Um, there's a couple of ways of discovering whether or not you have that uh, phenomenon going on. 
Um, probably the quickest, most graphic way to go, easy to see way to go would be to take the intake manifold off. Sometimes that's a lot of work. Uh, cylinder leak down test, we'll, we'll give it away also. Uh, you pressurize your cylinders, you read all four of them, not just one cylinder of course, right? You do comparative reading and you look to see what your percentage of leakage is. And if it happens to be on the intake side, you could suspect that we have slag built up on our valve face. Again, this is an internal air leak, okay? So of course, the what do we do about that, okay? Well, the answer is cleaning the valves. The two popular ways of doing this is either chemically, uh, which is where we began doing this, using all sorts of chemicals to go in there and remove the intake, um, Manifold, bring the pistons up to a uh, uh, position where the valves are closed and pouring a chemical in there in an emulsifier and picking away, physically picking away with a pick or a brush or whatever it may be and then drawing all this fluid out and trying very hard not to, um, you know, get yourself intoxicated on the fumes. Um, later on, this uh, kind of morphed into walnut shell blasting. And I'm sure everybody's heard about walnut shell blasting, but if you haven't, basically the process is a lot safer. And the idea is it's also a lot cleaner. And um, what you're doing here is basically the same procedure. You're bringing your piston to a position where the valves are completely closed. It's a dry process. So what we're doing is we're introducing a vacuum in there and simultaneously blasting with uh, walnut shell hulls. And this does a very good job of getting into the uh, the exhaust cha I'm sorry, the intake chamber and the back of the valve. And even it works down pretty close onto the valve face, okay? I like to also follow it up after I've drawn out all the walnut shells and I'm completing each cylinder. I like to go in there with a little uh, carburetor cleaner, if you will, and uh, get a little spray on the intake valve faces. This way we know that they're seating in nicely. Okay. Uh, what's nice about walnut shell blasting is anything that does get past the intake chamber winds up down in the uh, cylinder will go out through the catalytic converter and it'll give you a wonderful wood burning smell for a few minutes, but really won't harm anything. Okay. You, of course, want to be very, very careful with one of the shells that you don't leave the valves open because when you do that, you will fill the cylinder up. And then when you go to crank the engine, you'll probably have some sort of catastrophic failure, more than likely bent valves. So let's be very careful. And when we do walnut shell blasting, we are closing all the valves and working slowly, one cylinder at a time. Um, walnut shell blasting or clean valves will result in uh, a better performing engine. Uh, you, you could buy, be in a position here where you're chasing an unmetered air uh, fault code and, uh, and a misfire. So we do this procedure. We clean everything up. Maybe we put a set of plugs in. Um, we make sure our timing is correct, make sure our crankcase is filled with oil. We start the car up, and boy, it's running like no. Pretty good procedure. Uh, there are other machines out there. ATS has one, Intelligent Induction Cleaning System, of which uh, we offer here at Autologic at a deep, deep discount and you can call up for pricing. Uh, but I wanted to mention that because it's a, it's a third way of, of uh, cleaning uh, the intake valve. So something you may want to look into. So moving along, these are some of the ways that we can chase down unmuted air code. Again, I think the point of what I'm trying to get to here is that we don't always have a vacuum leak. Hell, there's not even very many vacuum hoses on the car, okay? There are components that can leak, of which is the biggest one is the valve cover that we discussed. You could possibly have a crankcase leak of some sort, but it's very, very rare. You could have a front timing cover seal. You could have a rear main seal, but that would be an oily mess that you would see. So really when we're looking at unmuted air codes, it's almost always internal, and it's caused by other mechanical faults. That's the point of what I'm trying to say here. All right, uh, just another a minute or two on the Valvetronic here. This little Valvetronic motor, I just want to mention that it has to be removed sometimes for either replacement or repair. Um, you may want to take it off the cylinder heads going out to the machine shop. Um, on BMW, we have a procedure where we set the car in a position so that we can remove this motor. And we do that so that we don't take the bolts out the motor which is spring-loaded or spring-tensioned, if you will, uh, fly, won't fly across the room. Uh, with this, it's a little simpler. Basically, what we're going to do is we're going to use our autologic tool to put it in a zero position, and we're just going to, there's a little four millimeter Allen on the back of it. And what we'll do is we'll loosen it up and loosen our fastening bolts a little, and you know, in a, a few turns at a time, and just basically back the, the motor out. It's the same procedure for putting it back in. Basically, what you're doing is you're letting that Valtronic, um, a crescent shaft uh, spring uh, relax so that the motor isn't uh, tensioned when you take it out. So you're basically unscrewing it 
and you're screwing it back in when you're ready to reinstall. So much for Valtronic. Let's move along. Here's a picture of the Valtronic motor. It gives you some specifications in the script here. Uh, biggest fault with these is not so much that the um, Valtronic crescent shaft the mechanical parts fail internally. They can. Um, but this motor does uh, do a lot of work. It is moving every time the ignition is turned on and while the engine is running. So it's constantly in motion. So a little electric motor like this can fail, you know, somewhere around the 100,000 mile mark. You may want to be looking to see if that's your problem, if we have a no start or fault code pertaining to activation or line disconnect, okay, or even short to positive, okay. A little more about uh, learning uh, stop positions. Basically, what I want to say about that is using your autologic tool, you have a, you go into the DME, you know, select the vehicle, go into the DME, go into your um, your adaptations, and the function is right there. And just basically follow the bouncing ball. It wants to see particular voltage, wants to see key on, key off. It's not done with the engine running. And then we, we go through the procedure of uh, learning that valve position, okay? And then what this will do is it'll allow the DME to sort of readapt as part of an adaptation, which is why we find it in adaptations. All right. A um, bunch of script about valve gear, pretty much hashed it out. Um, moving into air, so moving back into air supply, this is the uh, airflow meter that I mentioned that hardly ever fixes the problem. Now, I'm not saying that it can't fail, uh, but these are pretty durable airflow, airflow meters, okay? And um, unless you have something like a aftermarket performance air filter that's really oil saturated and that oil has been drawn into the uh, airflow meter and contaminated it, these things will pretty much function for a long, long time. Um, our fault codes, our unmetered fault air, air codes, uh, fault codes, uh, will always point to this first and say, go ahead and change it. It's a, as far as I'm concerned, it's a three to four hundred dollar guess. So we all know what airflow meters are. Basically, they are just reading the flow of air into the intake manifold. All right here, we have some uh, intake and exhaust cam sensors. Real straightforward stuff. It's just reading cam position. But again, cam position is extremely important. Okay. Um, let's talk about timing changes for a second. Okay. We, we're chasing down an unmetered air code. We have misfires. Uh, we go in and we measure the slack on our timing chain, and we find that we need to replace it. Um, I get asked every day, what is the spec? Well, I'm going to go back to my Mini Cooper training at BMW in New Jersey. And the way we were shown by our instructors and the way I learned it um, was 68 millimeters. And 68 millimeters was described to me as the raggedy edge of, of the amount of stretch allowed on the N14 timing chain. And, and this applies to N18 also. Okay. Of course, everybody raised their hands. So well, what does that mean? What's going on here? At that, at that increment, um, the guides inside, the plastic guides inside the engine are, are moving in towards each other. Okay. And, and what they do is they, uh, they have too much slack. Now they're going to bounce around. And this is where we start to see components come apart. We find plastic in the engine. There's also an upper guide bar in between the two cams. At 68 millimeters, that chain is bouncing against that guide bar. And now that guide bar is coming apart. So now we have debris, um, inside the engine. So I've always stuck with 68 millimeters with great fortune. It's always worked out well. So the argument comes up all the time. How come when I call up Mini Cooper or I read a book or I go to some other places, it says 72, even as much as 74 millimeters? Well, if we change the spec, we don't have to warranty any timing chains. That's my answer. I'm going to stick with that. So I'm looking at 68 millimeters to put my engine back in check. Um, Again, another word about timing chains. I've done a few of them, and I can tell you that when we do this job, uh, another problem is uh, uh, the phone call will come through. I've done a, a new timing chain. I have all new components in here. It's all factory stuff, or it's real good world pack stuff, and um, everything's fine. But now I now I have a cam correlation fault. Before I had a misfire and a, and a noisy chain, uh, now I have a cam correlation fault. Typically, what happens here is the chain did not get pretensioned. Very simple way to do this is you remove all your components, you put your new components in, you lay everything up hand tight. Preload the tensioner, just screw it in. The new tensioner's got a lot of load on it, okay? There's a probably six to eight different part numbers for all the tensioners they've had over the years. 
And what you want to do is load your tensioner in there and you're preloading the chain. You're also rolling the Vanos actuators and the crank gear into this preload position. Now remember, when we do these chains, this is, this is a um, interference fit engine. What this means is, uh, through the miracles of German engineering, we can tighten the bolt and these parts will stay in place. If we had another vehicle, we would use a keyway or a pin of some sort. We don't have any of that. So this is infinite. All right, so what we're going to do here is we're going to lock our engine, right? Again, don't attempt this job without the proper tools, okay? We have to pin our engine. Our engine is timed 90 degrees off top dead center, so we don't have a piston all the way up. All our pistons are in the middle of the bore, right? We've disconnected the batteries. So we don't chop our fingers off. We have a pinned engine, and now we have our camshafts ready to be locked with our other part of our tool. And uh, again, uh, a quick note on that is if you're wondering whether or not the cams are close to where they're supposed to be, look for the part numbers. If you have the valve cover off and look down into the camshafts, there's an electro-etched part number on each camshaft. It's in the middle of the camshaft, and it should be facing you. Now you know you're close. All right? And what you do is you lock your engine, disconnect your battery, you put your cam tools in, and now the engine is timed. Putting the timing chain on keeps that correlation and that timing correct. But there's no keyway, there's no pin. Okay? So what we do is we put our components on, once again, hand tight. We never reuse the bolts, never ever, no, not ever do we reuse cam bolts. Okay? Um, there have been instances where guys have gotten away with the crank bolt. I don't recommend it. And Cooper says replace it. I replace it. So we put all new, and the reason for that is these these are torque to fit. Okay, once 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 they've been tightened, they are stretch bolts. They're really no good. They won't hold uh, the torque again, at least not for any amount of time. So we put our engine together. We put it all together, all hand tight, and we take that tensioner out. We put the new fresh washer on it. We load it into the cylinder head. We've pre-tensioned the chain. All the cam gears have now been rolled to a position that when we tighten the bolts, starting from the crankshaft going up to the intake. And then over to the exhaust in that direction, usually the path I take, and it works well, okay, with new bolts properly torqued to the specification that BMW Mini Cooper re recommends. We now have an engine that can't roll out of time when we take the tools off. That's the point of what I'm trying to get to here, okay. If we haven't pre-tensioned the chain, all right, and we put all our stuff together and tighten it, when we put the tensioner in, we're now rolling the intake out, and we've picked up a cam correlation fault and can't understand why. All right, so I'm not going to beat a dead horse, but basically that's the procedure. That's what you need to know. When we have cam correlation faults, we have unmetered air because, again, the cams are not in the right place when the cam sensors, which we're looking at here, are trying to make a comparative reading to the crank sensor. All right. On our next page, we have a tensioner shown here. Um, if you're buying tensioners, or if you're buying uh, timing chain kits, I would probably uh, advise you to not buy the knockoff stuff. Try to get a quality kit. There's a lot of stuff out there. Uh, the original factory Mini Cooper kits are a few hundred dollars. People avoid them because of the expense. It's a good kit. It's the right one that belongs on the engine. There are many corporations out there that offer good replacement parts. Uh, and they should not be avoided. But there's some of this stuff that's on Amazon and what have you that's like around $50, $49. And you got to know that that stuff is not good stuff, okay? But in particular, the tensioner is not the latest version, and the chain is not a good, solid, strong uh, chain that's going to go the distance. So putting it in there, we'll probably have the customer back in a short period of time for another chain that you'll have to do for free. So we want to buy quality parts. Um, this is a device that I found while I was researching this little PowerPoint here. I just want to go on to this a little bit. A little device that they have come up with to measure uh, timing chain slack. All right. Typically, uh, what I've always used, let me go back a little bit here. What I've always used is the uh, tool that comes with the kit. All of the kits, including these very good um, aftermarket kits that are very affordable, come with a uh, tool that basically looks like a tension with a through bolt. And the idea here is we're going to screw that outside housing into place without a washer because we don't want to have that distance measured when we uh, uh, check our timing chain slack. We're going to put this housing in place. We're going to put through bolt through the housing. We're going to gently tighten it up against the guide bar that is now uh, pressing against the timing chain itself. And we're going to tighten that lock nut on there to 
0.6 newton meters. That's like less than hand tight. Um, you can sell a timing chain all day long just by cranking that bolt home, but we don't want to do that. We want to be honest, right? We want to put a nice gentle 0.6 newton meter tension on that through bolt. We want to lock it in place. We want to back the whole mechanism out and now measure from the shoulder of the housing to the end of the through bolt. Okay, that will give you a true measurement of how much slack is involved here. And again, anything past 68 uh, millimeters is uh, ready for timing chain, at least in my book. Um, one of the other things in regards to timing chains, and again, all of this, timing chain position, slack in the timing chain, cam correlation, uh, valve opening, valve position, all of these can uh, harken back to a unmetered air code. Okay, on, on meter code is very general sweeping code that says you find it. Okay, and this is some of the ways that we uh, use uh, processes we use to find unmuted air codes. On this page here, I threw I threw a bunch of um, uh, pictures together here for uh, just to, at the end of our little timing chain dissertation here, and it's something I found out that uh, uh, Mini Cooper is doing at the dealer level. Uh, as time has gone by and they have not built a better mousetrap. Um, buying timing chains and replacing timing chains and the time it takes to put them in becomes very, very expensive and particularly under warranty. In this little uh, page here, what they're doing now is something that's very much like, uh, any, any of you guys that are, uh, uh, know Mercedes-Benz, they roll the timing chains out and replace a master link. Well, now they're doing that at Mini Cooper. So which this means is we're putting a chain in, we're probably putting a tensioner in, uh, we're not changing any guide bars. We're not changing any lower uh, crank sprocket, and um, and we're not changing any Vanos actuators. But we're probably putting a tensioner in and a chain with a master link. I've not done this job. I don't know much about it. I'm not so sure I'm happy with it. But that's what's going on there. You can take a look at that also. Uh, I think that this was invented. This process was uh, created uh, just basically to save man hours. Because you know, time is money. All right. Um, what I did not mention, that seems to be another thing that's going on here, is premature ring failure. Uh, and this is in regards to unmetered air code once again. I just want to touch on this real quickly. Um, so far, I've been showing pictures of and talking about turbo engines, the N14 and the N18. Um, these are the engines I talk about a lot all day long. However, the N12 and the N16 exist out there, and these are non-turbo engines. The N12 in particular, I'm not exactly sure what was going on there, but they seem to fail prematurely, uh, with or without oil, uh, in the ring department, okay, also in the valve guide department, okay. Many times formal ring, we have unmuted air code, and we also have uh, profound misfires that are very difficult to get rid of. We've done a DME update, We've done all of these things, and we're not making any progress. We've done a valve cover on it. We put spark plugs in it. We put a set of coils in it, which everybody seems to do. Um, and that's sometimes uh, a home run for a misfire. It's not going to fix an unmuted air code. So we start talking about doing things like compression tests, uh, cylinder leak down tests, and um, Sometimes we even go as far as a running compression test. So what am I talking about? The engines come in, uh, the vehicles come in, the engines have somewhere in the area, say 80, 90, 100,000 miles on it. And by today's uh, specs, that should not be a big deal. Uh, but these engines, it is a big deal, especially if they've run low on oil, okay? And the way they seem to be running low on oil in those engines, the, again, the N12, the N16, seems to be premature ring failure and also premature valve guide failure okay there's a you know there's a lot going on underneath the uh, valve cover and for some reason I think it has to do with metallurgy I think it has to do with the products that were uh, used to develop these engines at the factory um, we wind up uh, pulling oil through the engine and uh, of course once we've done that uh, it goes back to where we started we can't control our cams because we have no oil to create hydraulic pressure for our vanos solenoids and our vanos actuators uh, we also have misfires we can't get rid of and we have blue smoke coming out the back. We'll start the car up. We'll let it sit for a few minutes. It'll come up to temperature, and then we'll go out there and give it a good romp. We'll stick our foot in it, and uh, we've got blue smoke all over the place, just like an old 283 Chevy from years ago. So what's going on? Well, you're pulling oil through the valve guides and or uh, pushing oil through your rings. So, again, the compression test and the comparative compression test, again, not just one cylinder because you've got a misfire in one. You test one. 
No, we're testing all four, and we're going to take our time with it. And our cylinder leak down test, uh, we're going to do uh, all four cylinders, and we're going to do a comparative test, and we're going to take our time with it. A uh, little note here, Mini Cooper allows 8% cylinder leakage. A lot of guys tell me, well, I've got 15 to 20%. I'm okay. Well, that'd be on other engines. That's okay. On this engine, 8%. Okay. On an N12 and an N16 engine, the compression is at 200 PSI. A lot of people are shocked to hear that it's so high. So when you tell me you have 140 or 130 and 120, that's not good. Okay. That's, that's low. One of the other things that I've discovered along the way working on N12 and N16 engines, when we're looking for where did the oil go or why do I have this uh, smoke coming out the back or I'm trying to test for uh, an unmetered air coat due to ring failure, okay, is I will do a, a compression test with the cylinder all the way up and then I will bring it down as far into the bore as I can before those valves open. And even if I have to hold it with a breaker bar, uh, I will I will re, I'm sorry, I'm talking about cylinder leak down test, of course, pardon me. And then what I'll do is I will refill that cylinder and see if my readings change. The idea here is we're looking for a bell-shaped cylinder. Okay, do we have ring failure or do we have a misshapen bore? Okay, one of the ways you can tell, it, again, a, a quick cheap farmer's test would be to test the compression or the cylinder leakage um, at the top of the cylinder and then repeat the test at the bottom of the cylinder see if it changes. If at the top it's good and at the bottom it's really bad, well, what does that tell you? Could very well be a, a bell-shaped cylinder. Um, and then, of course, now we're talking about uh, talking to the customer about an engine. All right, just a little sidebar on, on ring failure. I'm going to move to something else we talk about a lot. Getting away from unmetered air codes or, or, or internal vacuum leaks, I tried to touch on some of the common reasons why that happens. Uh, the um, other thing I wanted to just add before we move on to fueling um, is another fault code that I get a lot of. Uh, it's the 2885. And basically, 2885 says boost pressure uh, deviation. This is on turbo cars again. And again, we talk about a lot of turbo cars during the day. Boost pressure deviation, or 2885, simply means the boost is off. Uh, a lot of people say, well, I want to test the turbo, and I want to test the control system, and I want to test the weight skate and all of the stuff. And, and you should, because it could mean, it could very well mean that your turbo has failed. However, when we mix that with misfires and unmetered air codes and everything else, what's really happening here is the DME is not giving um, the open and close valve, the turbo solenoid, um, the authority or the permission to open and use the turbo. It's turning the turbo off. In other words, something wrong with the engine, and the DME has made the judgment call that we're not going to allow boost. So we have a boost pressure deviation or boost is off. So we can buy a turbo or go through all sorts of vacuum checks. We can go through all sorts of wastegate checks and, and all this stuff. You're focusing on the turbo because we have a turbo boost code, but when, in fact, we have the DME shutting the turbo off because something else is wrong. And this is where um, this whole discussion about timing chain position, cam correlation, unmuted air codes, and misfires come in because the DME will see that and say, no good, no bueno, not going to happen, no boost, okay? Of course, the other thing can happen is we can make all these repairs on a car and we still don't have boost. Now we're going to look at the things that uh, create that situation, you know, vacuum pump, uh, hose routing, and of course the uh, the big failure, which is the uh, uh, turbo wastegate control valve, which is a little electric solenoid under the intake manifold. And uh, they don't age well. Somewhere around 100,000 miles, they've got rust in them and they don't want to move. So the DME is commanding boost, but it's not happening. So it's something to think about. Uh, okay, moving forward here to our other favorite code, uh, 2880. This fault, code also, this fault code almost always winds up with the high-pressure fuel pump being replaced, okay? The um, 2880 is saying that we, don't, we have not met the set point pressure. Let's talk about set point pressure. Uh, let's talk about the N14 engine. It's an easy discussion. At the back of our intake camshaft, again, our intake camshaft being driven by our timing chain and our Vanos actuator, okay? At the back of our intake camshaft, we have a, a mechanically driven high-pressure fuel pump. And basically what it's doing is it's taking five bar of delivered pressure from a electric pump, which is in the tank, okay? And it's that pressure is being sent to the back of the uh, high-pressure fuel pump, and it's being held at bay by a volume control valve. The volume control valve on pond command from the DME opens, and that fuel goes into our high-pressure fuel pump. And now mechanically, it's ramped up to thousands of PSI. 
and that high pressure goes through a steel line into our uh, fuel injectors and it's sprayed into the engine. That's a direct injection method, theory. That's how it works, okay? So why am I getting this fault code, okay? What you may witness, the most common complaint from the customer, or even from the tech to me, is that the car came in, I went out there, I hit the key, and it started and it ran poorly. Uh, it started and it stalled. It started, it ran poorly and flaked misfires. But then after a few seconds, or even a minute, uh, it began to run well. Check engine light is still on. So I cleared the fault codes and the car runs great. What you just witnessed is the inability of the high pressure fuel pump to prime up upon cold start command. Okay. So the way we see this is using your logic tool, you go into diagnostic requests under the DME and you look for your set point pressure. Now in here I have a couple of little pictures here. Let me see if I can find them for you. Uh, this is a screenshot of the AutoLogic uh, front page. This is us going, we've already selected the vehicle, we've gone into DME, we're talking about an N14 engine, so we're going to pick this DME here, which is the MEV17. Okay, we're going to click on that. Uh, bring us the diagnostic requests, and we will look at the high uh, pressure fuel readings. Unfortunately, I got these out of sync. This is an N18 page. Let me go one more page, and I'll show you that the N14 page will look like this. So what we want to look at here to get a look at why is our car running like that upon cold startup? Why do I have this 2880 fault code? I suspect I need a high pressure fuel pump anyway. How can I prove it? So what we want to look at on this page for the N14 is fuel pressure set point value, which is measured in bar, and fuel pressure actual value, and the actual is the important word here. So what we're looking for is our set point is a minimum of 50 bar, okay? And what it's going to do is it has to see, again, I said 5 bar from the low pump, 50 bar at the high pressure pump. So as soon as that begins to spin, the very instant it begins to spin, the set point value must reach 50 bar. Okay, many, many times it does. But what you don't see, and this can only be seen in the first few seconds of of activation or running the engine and always cold, okay, we see that the actual does not meet that minimum 50 bar. So you'll see something along the lines of 29, 30, 32, maybe it'll drop back, maybe it'll shoot off the Richter scale, it'll go up to 80 and drop back to 40, it's all over the place. What you're seeing is the rail, the fuel injectors, don't have that minimum set point of 50 bar to function correctly when they're cold. So a few seconds go by, and of course what's happened now is the DME being the watchdog, always vigilant, always watching, uh, measuring our cam position, measuring our crank position, says, hey, what's going on here? Okay, and of course reading the O2s, which haven't quite kicked in yet, but the data is there, right? And it's saying, wait a minute, I'm, I'm, I'm counting misfires all over the place, so it flags misfires. Now when you go back and you do your fault code read, you got 2880 and misfires across the board. Um, what I'm trying to illustrate here is that when you looked at that actual value and it was low and it took a few seconds to catch up, that's when the DME flagged the misfires. So we turn the key off. Maybe we run a quick test. We start the car back up and it runs perfectly, but you still have all these misfires. You still have a check engine light on. Stop the engine, clear the misfires, engine's running perfectly. What you witnessed was the inability of the high pressure fuel pump to prime up on cold start. So the theory here is if it can happen cold, it will and can over time happen hot. So the other complaint you get is I'm driving along car stalled, or I'm driving along and I go into limp home mode, or I'm trying to accelerate on the ramp, I get a check engine light and the car is just bogging and lagging and it won't go. Okay. Uh, again, you may um, go in with your AutoLogic tool and run a quick test and find that 2885 no boost pressure flagged also because the DME saw a profound problem. Okay, so again, we don't have a turbo problem. We've got a fueling problem. Fix the fueling problem. Erase them. Misfires, 2885 goes away. Boost comes back. Let me just back up a little bit here. When we go to N18, I, I kind of got that slide out of sync. I do apologize. But when we go to N18, the diagnostic request page looks a little more like this. Okay, and when we go on to when we select high pressure, okay, the uh, the data sheet is is trimmed down to just two bars. And again, it's the same as the other thing, 
but now the reading changes. It's not in bar, it's in MPA, okay, millipascals. And this is really just a question of uh, metrically moving the, uh, the dot over to one way or the other. So you'll see 500 megapascals, and when you do the conversion, you're right there at 50 bar. So it's another thing. You may want to keep a conversion chart nearby. Don't, I'm sorry. Let's not be fooled by megapascal and kilopascal, okay, uh, readings and confuse them for bar. Make sure you're looking at it as all one thing. Uh, bar or PSI, if that's what's most convenient for you, is the easiest conversion. Let's go a little further. Here's our low pressure, and again, they've changed the reading. It's not megapascal, it's not bar, it's kilopascal. So again, make sure you, you're using one um, conveyance, if you will, one reading that you understand uh, to, to, uh, to see what these uh, pumps are doing. Uh, typically, what you'll see here is uh, kilopascals uh, will be read in the hundreds, if, I have to, if memory serves, and I could be corrected. I think it stands at 625 or something like that. And when we do our um, our math, we, we have enough to meet our uh, set point pressure. Now, low pressure fuel pumps um, do not age or fail like the high pressure pump. They're pretty durable, uh, but they do go away. Um, what you want to do here is if you suspect that this reading is fluctuating or it's not there or it doesn't come on when we open the door and take a reading, uh, again, opening the door sets off the cast, the cast wakes up the vehicle, the wake-up signal goes to the electric fuel pump, electric fuel pump gets ready for you to start the car. So if we don't see this come up, okay, if we don't see a solid low-pressure electric uh, in-tank fuel pump reading and our car is not starting at all, we may want to go here first, you know, stay away from the high-pressure pump, come back to it later after we've got our low-pressure issues worked out. Let's see what else we've got for you. So motor operating values, uh, as seen by the Autologic, um, I really wish there was more motor operating values uh, on the Autologic, and someday there will be. Uh, as we move into Drive Pro, we seem to, seem to get more and more data. But using this, one of the things I wanted to show you that's another mitigating factor for correct engine operation um, is battery voltage and coolant temperature. Okay, there's our airflow reading right up top. Uh, everybody asks me, what's that supposed to be? I'm going to throw 14 out there. Okay, uh, typically when we have, let's say, a 4-liter engine, it's 4. 5-liter engine, it's 5. Here we have a 1.6-liter engine, and it's 14. I don't have an answer. But that's what it is, 12 to 14. Okay, Battery voltage is very important. Um, not so much for an unmetered air code, but for functionality of the DME to read everything correctly. Uh, I talk about batteries every day. Um, Mini Cooper built these cars to run on a, uh, a peak of voltage uh, uh, that it really, really, really does want to see of 12.4 to 12.6. Um, 12 volts is nice, but it's really at the bare minimum. Consider this. Uh, again, we'll go back to cold start on a winter's day on an old battery, uh, a battery that I call marginal. And we start the car up, and that battery goes to 10.5, okay? The way it works is, uh, in some cases, an intelligent battery sensor, in some cases, just the DME signal to the alternator has to happen. And that signal from the DME, again, you know, the overlord of the whole engine bay, is going to tell that alternator to begin charging. It doesn't tell the alternator how much to charge. It just says how long. And it does this on what they call a BSD, a bit serial data signal, okay? And it takes a few seconds, sometimes longer, depending upon DME programming, integrity of that BSD signal, wear and tear on the alternator, age of the battery, and it goes on and on. Okay, it takes a while for that battery to begin charging, and then when it does happen, the, the battery begins to charge slowly. So what's happened here? Okay, we start our car, it runs poorly, it throws misfires. I get all these crazy codes all over. I've got stuff here in the engine that I never saw before. Well, my battery has 12 volts. Well, what's happened here is your marginal battery tanked on you. It's taking too long to recover, and the DME is starving for voltage because other consumers, like the Valvetronic motor, if it has one has cut in, right? Our uh, coolant circulator pump for our turbo might be functioning, a fan is on, and of course any other option in the car that's on, like a heater or an air conditioning, wipers, headlights, and so on, are all putting a huge demand on the battery, and there's not enough recovery voltage for the DME. 
So a marginal battery in this case is as bad as a bad battery. I always recommend a load test. And the load test should be done with the cables off the battery. Okay. A lot of guys go with the Midtronics, which is a very nice tool. I applaud it. It's a great tool. Uh, being as old as I am, I like to go back and use um, an older device, something with a carbon pile. Um, the idea here is you're putting a true load on the battery, and if that old piece of technology you may have is still functioning properly, you'll be able to see how quickly that battery is dropping off, what the rating is on it, and you get a much clearer picture of, of a poor battery. It's very important because this best peak voltage of 12.4 to 12.6 is so significant, in particular to the DME's proper function. Excuse me. All right, so I just want to show you this page so we can see uh, this is where battery voltage is read, okay? And, of course, we have other modules in the car like the CAS module that need to see um, uh, proper supply of voltage because it's controlling all our 15 voltages and our 30 voltages, the voltages that are supplied to the vehicle after the key is on, okay? So if the incoming voltage is too low, the outgoing voltages from the CAS will be equally as low, and now we have a whole bunch of other body faults, and it's all going back to a marginal battery. Okay, it really doesn't have anything to do with the heater or the radio. They just don't have enough voltage. Okay, something to consider. All right, so let me just kind of wrap this up a little bit here because we're running out of time. Um, in regards to the high-pressure fuel system, I did put this photograph in here just to give you an overall picture. I gave you a little, uh, I clipped a little data out of uh, ISTA so you can see what's going on there. And uh, this is pretty much the layout for a high-pressure fuel system. That's an injector. We went over that. Uh, this is the high-pressure pump. This is the volume control valve that I mentioned earlier. Okay. This guy has to be satisfied with the correct amount of pressure. And just as I said with voltage, it has to be supplied with the correct amount of voltage for it to function properly. If it can't control fuel volume, you won't meet your set pressure. It goes on a bit here to talk about the layout of the uh, uh, fuel tank and the low-pressure fuel pump. This is what the low-pressure fuel pump looks like. I'm sure everybody's seen something like this. There's your uh, sending unit at the bottom of it. All right, there are two sending units used in these uh, early saddle tanks, one on the left, one on the right. There's only one fuel pump in the tank. There are not two, although it looks like there's two. And the fuel pump is on the driver's side. So I think we'll wrap it up from there. I think that's as far as they want me to go tonight. Everyone's tired of listening to me. I thank you very much for your attention. I hope I... Gave you something you can run with.